Hi, I'm Ed Amundsen. I'm the pastor here at High Street Baptist Church. We are so glad that you tuned in to worship with us today. And as you do, our hope is that you will hear from God through the reading of the word and that you will participate in the worship of God uh, from the comfort of your computer, wherever you may be, or your handheld device. As we go throughout the service, our hope is, is that you will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ if you've never done so before. And if you already are a believer, we hope that you will deepen your relationship with Christ as a result of this worship service. Uh, thank you for tuning in. You may want more information on how you can get engaged uh, more deeply with the church. And if that's the case, you'll notice down here on the screen is our church information. You can call us or you can go to our website at www.highstreetsomerset, and as you can tell, that's all spelled out, dot O-R-G. Uh, that website is also open to secure electronic giving, and you can do that simply by clicking on the menu icon at the top portion of the screen. The menu will click down, and you'll see Give. You can click on that if you'd like to donate. Other than that, God bless you for being here. We hope that it will be a joyous time. And now let's get ready to worship.
you got a Bible, let me invite you to grab it and turn with me to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. When you find your place there, let me invite you to stand with us in honor of the God that we serve in his written word. Genesis chapter 6, we're going to begin reading in verse 9. Probably a very familiar story to most of you. Uh, the story of Noah and his ark. So we'll begin reading in verse 9 of Genesis chapter 6. The word of the Lord says to us, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is the word of the Lord. Let us respond to it by lifting our voices in song as we sing together, Have Faith in God. Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the way you have trod. Never alone are the least of his children. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. He cannot fail. Must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God when your prayers are unanswered. Your earnest plea he will never forget. Wait on the Lord. Trust his word and be patient. Have faith in God. He'll answer yes. Have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Have faith in God in your pain and your sorrow. His heart is touched with your grief and despair. Cast all your cares and your burdens upon him and leave them there, oh, leave them there. Have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. He cannot fail. Must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God, though all else fail about you. Have faith in God. He provides for his own. He cannot fail, though all kingdoms shall perish. He rules, he reigns upon his have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Amen. You may be seated. But I want to continue to remind you uh, to keep all matters 
before us in prayer. Uh, part of that is our tithes and offerings through the boxes and through the online giving. And the rest of that is to pray for one another. You can't build community in the church if you don't have prayer warriors praying with one another. And I do want to thank you for coming this morning, many of you, and praying over our family. And that was unsolicited. So I'm sure if we would have said, come on down, every last person would have been down there. And uh, thank you for your continued prayers for Silas and for his headaches. And we're praying for breakthroughs. Uh, add to that list Joan Kemper, Amy Wilson's mother in ICU. Of course, we're continuing to pray for Miss Cheryl and the entire Shoemaker and Lay uh, families. Uh, just continue to cover them in prayer. Uh, also praying for Austin Baker following an appendectomy uh, emergency. Uh, so be in prayer for him. Dee Payne and her uh, three cousins that lost husbands since Christmas. Ray Brandon, as you saw, was here today, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. He still has a procedure forthcoming. Uh, in about another week, they'll take that other blockage and put a stent in. At least that's the plan. Uh, Aaron Baker went back to the doctor this week and is still struggling with this kind of long-term extreme mono. So be in prayer for him, uh, the family of Junior Kennedy, and then third Thursday, men's breakfast. Please get the word out far and wide. Men's breakfast, third Thursday, this Thursday at Bob Evans from 7 to 9. And then um, we are praying for Brother Alan Dodson. And uh, just so glad to have someone, the caliber of Brother Alan, on staff, uh, bringing the breadth and width of his ministry tenure as well as his experience as the 5th Region Kentucky Baptist Convention's pastoral consultant. And so that's another big asset that God has added to the staff. We're so thankful that you saw that that way and that you've appointed him to this opportunity. Brother Allen will be in that first office on the left. And uh, he's already started moving in until uh, the extreme freeze hit us, and then there was a slight flood. We're going to talk about another flood tonight, but uh, we took care of that other flood. It was a little one compared to ones we've seen. Uh, and we're praying for our Hispanic mission pastor as well, uh, Brother Richard Vilka, his family, and also uh, our newest members besides the Vilkas are uh, Samuel and his wife, the motions. So if you'll continue to pray for them. They had 14 this morning again. So they're hitting that steady 14. And I know that we're going out this Friday uh, to the highways and hedge groves, beating on the bushes, trying to get some more folks to be aware. So continue to be in prayer for those. You may have an unspoken prayer request you want to indicate tonight by the uplifted hand. Please look up at the list and uh, grab a name or two, or if you have a photographic memory, just blink a couple of times and take a picture of that. And uh, let's take all of these prayer concerns, our tithes, our offerings, and our worship to the Lord tonight as an offering. Lord, again, we are, we are absolutely grateful to have a night service, Lord, on the first day of the week, the Lord's Day, where together we can join as the community of believers, the family of God, called so not by any imagination of the heart of man, but by the very proclamation of the Word of God. And Lord, we are called your own people because of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who reconciled us, who adopted us into the family of faith. And it is through his death, burial, and resurrection that miracle of transformation took place. And Lord, thank you that we are the beneficiaries of the Holy Spirit of God living in us and dwelling with us and bringing forth tonight praise from our lips to your holy ears. May it be a fresh and may it be a pleasing aroma to you, God. And Lord, tonight we add to these prayers and praises and these thanksgivings, these lists of people, Father, that have needs. And God, each of the needs are individualistic and they're different. And Lord, you've heard the unspoken prayer requests. 
And so, God, we know that there is nothing that we can do any better than to turn all of these over to you and lay them at your feet. So, God, through the Holy Spirit tonight, we pray by faith to the Lord Jesus Christ, our high intercessor and our high priest, who is offering these prayers to you. And, Lord, we celebrate the fact that each and every one of these prayers will be answered. And we look forward for that answer, God. For we believe by faith in advance to receive it according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, if you were here this morning, you heard Brother Ed come down pretty hard on me for being a Mac guy. Um, and, you know, everybody's entitled to be wrong uh, occasionally. But there are some disadvantages to having a phone and an iPad and a computer and everything that's all connected and that's when your phone rings when you're leading and your iPad rings too uh, because it's telling me that I have a phone call so if you heard that during the last song that's what that was that was my iPad ringing but nonetheless so uh, if you would stand with us again as we continue to sing and worship together let's sing Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written. Depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there, who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied To look on Him and pardon me To look on Him and pardon me Behold Him there, the risen Lamb My perfect spot righteousness the great unchangeable I am the king of glory and of grace one with himself I cannot die my soul is purchased by his blood my life is hid with Christ on high with Christ my Savior and my God with Christ my Savior and my God. Father, we thank you so much for uh, the way that you love us. We thank you that you are indeed a God who has provided for our every need. That begins with the fact that you provided your son who lived a perfect sinless life, died a cruel death on a cross so that we might have life and have it abundantly. And Father, we recognize that even now before the throne, we have an advocate in Jesus who is ever living and pleading for us. Father, we are unworthy of such goodness and grace, but you so freely bestow it upon us. Father, we love you. We praise you. Give you thanks. As we turn to your word, we pray that you would speak to our hearts and to our minds tonight by the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask that the Spirit of God would speak to us through the Word of God, and we would be faithful to be obedient to all that we find within it. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
and Brother Brandon that my Surface Pro uh, Android will never ring. <laughs> and it is not because it can't fancy dance hook up to my phone. It's because I am not technologically savvy enough to know how to do that. So, no ringing tablets for me. Uh, so just another advantage of Android, you have to be a little smarter to operate the instrument, and I'm not that smart. So um, we are in the Read Scripture app, and I'm so thankful we actually have finished the book of Genesis as of last night, uh, which is no small feat. That's a lot of reading. However, uh, if you break it up into those bite-sized pieces like Read Scripture does, you find just a few chapters a night, and you are zooming through. We've also gone through uh, now 13 psalms. And so what a privilege it is to be reading the Bible. Does it make you feel good? It makes me feel good to know that I'm getting some really good Bible reading. And this is so good. My family gathers around, and together we all do this. And this is such a privilege. And I know... Um, some families have a little bit of younger ones, and maybe this is a little too lengthy for them, but you can still read a little bit with them. And uh, then you and your spouse finish the rest on your own. Uh, so, uh, as we come into tonight, you cannot read through uh, the book of Genesis without pausing in a couple of places. Uh, of course, creation. Uh, Noah is a huge, huge point to stop. This is where the covenant is restated so you have to stop here you have to stop again with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are important too you can't just kind of ramrod through there and say okay we read through Genesis now it's time for numbers and our Exodus numbers Leviticus Deuteronomy on and on and on uh, so tonight I want to talk about Noah because Noah is a man who epitomizes that costly messy advantageous obedience that each of us need in our personal lives to be that community that God is calling us to be. And we see that in Genesis chapter 6 verse 9 that Brother Brandon read to us. And I want to revisit that again. Uh, Moses, of course, is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And Genesis chapter 6 verse 9 tells us, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man blameless in his generation and Noah walked with God when you see that word blameless let me tell you what it means it means free from defect it means wholesome it means sound and when you see that it doesn't mean that Noah was perfect it doesn't mean that Noah was somehow sinless but it does imply something special about Noah that I believe is special about you too if you truly are a follower of Jesus Christ. And that is someone who consistently walks with God. Even in the midst of a troubled generation, even in the midst of, uh, of social media, even in the midst of cultural wars and political destruction and, and all the things that are happening today, I do believe there are some special people who are walking with God in obedience. And because of that, I want you to hear some of the verses about Noah, just to kind of form the character sketch. In chapter 6, verse 22, the Bible says, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. In chapter 7, and verse 5, the Bible says, And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. In chapter 7, verse 9, the Bible tells us, as God had commanded Noah. Chapter 7, verse 16, as God had commanded Noah. Chapter 8, verse 15 and 16 and 18, then God said to Noah, come out of the ark, so Noah came out. Noah's motto must have been, just do it, God's way. Just do it, God's way. And what you see here is I want you to notice something very important. We read past this a lot. But did you see in the story, God does all the talking. Noah never once says anything. Noah is being quiet. He's listening to God. And everything God commands, the word of God says, Noah was faithful to do it. 
And so as we look at Noah's example of obedience, there are three things that we want to notice. Number one, obedience is costly. Number two, obedience is messy. But finally, the, the coup de gras is obedience is advantageous. Number one, obedience is costly. Go with me back to chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. And listen, the word of God says, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. Now, I just want to pause here for just a second. Just a little programming note. Take verse 14. Tuck that in your back pocket till the conclusion of this message. You're going to need this verse. And it's going to blow you away. So hold on to that one. But verse 15. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. Its height, 30 cubits. And you can go on, make a roof uh, for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door for the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. How many of you all been to the ark experience in northern Kentucky? It is a massive, massive creation. And it is done with the artist's concept of, by dimension, what the ark would have looked like. As you're driving up to it, you can see it before you can see anything else. And it is monstrous in size. I want you to notice the details of the ark, the dimensions of the ark. The length alone of the ark would span, in today's distance, three and a half to four and a half football fields, NFL style. Imagine 100 yards, 100 yards 100 yards, another 100 yards, 50 yards. My goodness, what an incredible length it was. But what's really interesting to me is the length and the ratio of the width and the height are still the exact dimensions that ocean-going vessels are made by today. It may not be the same size, but it's by the same dimensions so did God know what he was doing? Absolutely. This, though, was a massive project for one man. It would be like today the U.S. Navy commissioning uh, a destroyer to be built, an immense destroyer, maybe even an aircraft carrier, and one man agreeing to build it. So what do we see? Well, we see that obedience is costly, but we also see under that Noah became a fool for the Lord. And here's why. In the days of the, before the flood, I personally, based on scripture, based on the fact that this is the first time that, that rain is mentioned, based on the fact that there was no rainbow until rain happened, so no one had ever seen a rainbow before, but so much more, I don't believe that anybody before the flood had ever seen rain. And one of the reasons you can find it in the, in the first chapter of the first book is that the water came from the ground up. But there was a firmament in the sky and there was a firmament below of water in both cases. And so it wasn't needed because the dew was able to water. And then, and then on top of that, every spring, the snow from the mountains in the northern area of Mesopotamia where Noah would have lived, they would melt and the water would run down through the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. This was in the same general area as the Garden of Eden. And the waters would overflow the banks and would water the fields. And then they would recede. But what's interesting is the area itself, climatologists estimate, would have been very dry and arid. Probably in the summertime getting as hot as 110 up to 115 degrees Fahrenheit, it was a very dry place. And so the water from the two rivers was crucial. But I want you to see all of this because if you can imagine this landscape, then building such a huge seafaring vessel this far from the Mediterranean Sea, this far from any massive body of water, it would have been seen as foolish. What is he building? Some new shopping mall? What is he building? We've never seen anything like this before. Why would this man waste so many years when he could be with us 
partying it up, living it up, having fun, doing all the things that God's word says you're not supposed to be doing. And he was likely greeted because of that with scorn and mockery and derisions by the locals. I want to read you a verse that kind of substantiates this from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, which I might add is the hall of faith, the greatest of the Bible that God brings up in Hebrews chapter 11 to give an example of their faith. And here's what Hebrews eleven seven 7 says. The writer of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writes, By faith Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. Now watch this. By this he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. I want you to see how Noah responded to the thoughts and the opinions and the possible derision and jeering from his neighbors. The Bible says that he condemned the world. Now before you get excited and you say, we're not supposed to judge Brother Ed and, 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 and we shouldn't condemn anyone. Don't misunderstand that word. That word condemn in the original language means to condemn by contrast. And this reinforces what God said of Noah, that Noah was blameless before his generation. But what it means specifically is it means to show good conduct and obedience in contrast to bad conduct. Uh, Noah was showing how guilty all other people were by his own obedience to the Lord. And by the way, it was to their condemnation. Jesus Christ did the same thing, only he was perfect. And his, his behavior also exposed the condemnation that we deserved, but he took it a step further because he was able to save us. In fact, we'll get to that in just a minute. But I wanted you to see this because the question that came across to me immediately is this. Am I willing to be a fool, an outright blaming fool for the Lord in this current world that we live in? Because in the increasing marginalization that we see happening of Christianity in the West, a lot of Christians are facing mockery and persecution and jeering and criticism. And we are being segregated because of our faith. We're being told at school board meetings we can't speak. We're being told that we can't have a voice in government. We're being told that we can't do the things we want to do or say the things we want to say because they are offensive to some. And you know what? This is only going to get worse. And how do I know that? Because Jesus himself in Matthew's gospel, chapter 24, verse 37, said this, As were the days of Noah so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And I don't know about you. I don't know if it's going to be today or 10 years from now, but I know we're soon. And so the days that we live in are very similar to the days of Noah. So I'm not just talking about enduring scorn or maybe taking a little heat on social media or maybe losing a friend or two. Or, or maybe having a, a relative come and tell you that you're no longer part of the family or the, any of those things. I'm talking about the kind of living by radical faith that will make you look foolish, might even paint a target on your chest or put a target on your family. Because I want you to understand, Noah became a fool for the Lord. He was willing to condemn the world by his blameless following and obedience to God. But not only was Noah a fool for the Lord, he became a foreman for the Lord. What do I mean by that? Imagine what obeying the Lord cost Noah in his day. Think about the time. Think about the, the finances. Think about the sweat. Think about the energy. Think about the sacrifices. Obeying God wasn't Noah's hobby. It's obvious it was his heart's desire. It was what he wanted to do more than anything. When I look back at the early days of, of mine and Shannon's relationship, you know what I've realized over the years? I've realized 
there's almost nothing I won't do for Shannon. Literally. From the very first time that we met and went out, we went to the best restaurants. We, we, we walked back and, and I got her a carriage ride. I mean, there was nothing that I would not do for this woman. And to this very day, if she asked me to do something and I don't forget, that's another message. But if I remember it, I'm going to do it, no matter what it is. Why? Because I love her. Listen, when you love someone, you are eager to please them. You don't have to be told what to do. You don't have to be told when to do it. You don't have to be told how to do it. It just comes natural. You may be a miser of your own finances, but if someone you love says, I need that, you're going to buy it. Because that's what you want to do. If your loved one needs something, you're going to provide it no matter what. I'm reminded of Sam and Noonie Rayburn. And how at the end of, of their lives, Noonie got Alzheimer's. And she was, had to be in a nursing home full time. And Sam was not in the greatest of health either. And uh, they both lived well, well up. Sam was in his 90s. And so Sam put her in the nursing home, regrettably, but he had to. But he didn't just put her in the cheapest nursing home. He didn't put her in the, the dirtiest nursing home or the one that, that maybe the state might put you into uh, if they had a bed because it's cheaper on the state than another one. No, Sam put her in a place where he told me he was paying, uh, when he started, over $6,000 a month. And when it ended, when he was living there, they were paying over $13,000 a month for that nursing home. I'm going to tell you, there were a lot of cheaper places. I've been to all the nursing homes here, and some of them are great, but there are some real wingdingers. And he could have put her there and saved himself a buck. And you know what? Let's just be honest. With the kind of rapid onset of Alzheimer's, that Noonie had, she never would have known. But here's the thing. Sam knew. Sam knew who he loved. He went to visit her every single day, and he stayed from the time that visiting hours started, and he stayed all the way until visiting hours were over. And you know what? She never even knew who he was. But Sam knew who he loved. He knew who she was. And every now and again, that glint of understanding would return to her eye and she'd pat his hand or give him a kiss on the cheek. And man, that was all the payback that Sam needed to spend another $6,000 the next month to go and spend another nine hours with his sweetie. And he did that until the day he died. Why? Why would Sam do something like that? Because he loved his beloved Noonie. And there was nobody else like her. And nobody else was going to take her away. And nobody else was going to drag Sam away. My friends, when you have a heart's desire for someone, then you don't have to battle over commitment. You don't have to battle and wrestle with obedience or faithfulness. Because there's no one else you'd rather be with. Noah became a fool and a foreman because why? He stayed focused. In Genesis 6, 3, the Bible states, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His day shall be 120 years. Over the years, people have looked at this Bible verse and said, Well, I guess God got tired of people being 969 years old. So he set the number down to 120 years, and that's why nobody seems to be able to live past 120 years and that sounds great and it sounds feasible but that's absolutely I'm convinced not what God's saying here what God's saying here is that the 120 years was a countdown to man's destruction God's saying my spirit has striven with man in his sinfulness all of this time since the garden and it's only going to be another 120 years that I'm going to strive with him and then the end is going to come. And if you notice, right after that was when God commanded Noah to build the ark. Which is why when people ask me, how long did Noah build the ark? My answer is 120 years. 120 years it told to make that ark. 
And, and I want you to understand what would have happened if Noah, in those 120 years, and I believe it took every minute of those 120 years, what if he would have been distracted by the naysayers? What if he would have gotten hurt and upset and decided to take a day off so he wouldn't have to listen to the, to the people snickering and laughing or making fun of him? Imagine what would have happened if Noah had given in to the aches and pains of his body. Think about this. He was 480 years old when he started building the ark. The Bible says he was 600 years old when the rain began to fall. 480 years old, I can barely bend over and touch my feet as it is, and I'm just going to be 54. I can only imagine a a 480-year-old man who is building this monstrous ark, but I believe God gave him the energy and the strength and the vitality. But what would have happened if Noah focused all his energies and time on his family? Or what would happen if, if he'd gotten into the cultural definition of what uh, was good to do. And maybe he didn't necessarily go to the only evil always portion of his heart. But what if he uh, got involved in the local sports of the day, became a real big fan? Or, or what if he did find a hobby? Or, or just think of all the things that could have happened. Thank God for Noah's focus and his persistence. Because without that, guess what? The whole world would have been wiped out. None of us would be here. Noah got up every day for 120 years in the face of the naysayers, the mockers, the persecution, the pains, the the family problems when his kids were sick. He couldn't just run home and take care of them. Uh, He he made the aging... (laughs) Uh, All of the temptations to stop because his shoulders hurt, his legs hurt, but he continued to do what God told him to do day in and day out. And that, my friends, is why obedience to God is costly. Obedience to God is costly. But second, obedience to God is also messy. Look at verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah's righteous, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jepheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. Obedience for Noah meant walking blamelessly with God in the midst of a perverted and crooked generation. It meant uh, being blameless, to uh, to stand out. And you know what? Being a Christian means also to be blameless in Christ, to To have that good reputation, that good character, to show forth the light of life who John in his gospel says is Jesus Christ. That light, he said, was the light of life to men. So whereas Noah was called to the ministry of condemnation, he knew that shining the light before the darkness was going to end in the darkness is condemnation. We as Christians have been called to the ministry of reconciliation. The good news is when you and I shine our light, we're not convicting someone in the court of law to death and punishment. When we shine the light of Jesus Christ, we are bringing the opportunity for salvation and redemption and freedom. Noah left the darkness behind But you and I, once we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, we are called to go back into the darkness as light bearers to create a community of the light of life in the midst of darkness. And as that community, you and I, we are shining our lights together to be one strong search beacon for all the lost to see. So that any man who is in darkness can find his way to the ark of salvation, Jesus Christ. And I I say that because I once was rescued. I don't know if you know this about me. I think I've included it as an illustration once. But uh, not a lot of people know when I was 14 years old, my mother took me to Sarasota, Florida in the Siesta Keys. And it was just me and my mom and another lady. I was very much younger. My mother was 40 when she had me. And so 14, she's 54. Uh, My mom's friend was in her 60s. 
and they wanted to do shuffleboard and, uh, you know, drink the little drinks with the little umbrellas in them, and they wanted to sit out in the sun, but a 14-year-old boy doesn't want to sit in the sun, and he sure doesn't want to play shuffleboard, and he doesn't care a lick about any of those foo-foo drinks. He'll take a, 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 at that time, an RC and a moon pie would have done me just fine. So my mom decided that it, there wasn't much for a 14-year-old boy to do, so she went and bought me uh, goggle, cheap goggles, flippers, and a really cheap plastic snorkel. And she told me, go play in the water. Now, that was my mom, you understand? Danger was nothing to her. She, she saw danger as if I could survive it, then I would be strengthened for living. And if I didn't survive it, she had other children. So mom said, go play in the surf. And we knew nothing about ebb tides. If you know anything about ebb tides, there are different forms of tides. There's rip tides, which pull you under. There's incoming tides, which bash you against the rocks. And then there's ebb tides. These are like little super highways that if you get in them, they just drag you right out to sea. If you stay in them long enough. And guess what? I stayed in it long enough. I was swimming and I was looking at all the fish and all the little different creatures and the sand. And I would just fin in my way and I got into one of these ebb tides and didn't even realize it. And so as I'm finning forward in the ebb tide, I'm probably doing about three, four miles an hour. And I don't realize it because to me I'm just kicking around, you know, looking around. And so after about 30 minutes of this, I noticed my back was starting to feel a little crispy. And, and then, then I saw the bottom just kind of drop off into darkness. And when I came bobbing up to the surface, I looked around, and there was no land in sight. Not a hotel, nothing. And about 20 yards from me, there was something, and, and I, have the, I, have the, I have the actual name of it, a starboard bifurcation buoy. These buoys are about this tall. They're metal. They have a round bottom, and they have a bell in them. And they move back and forward with the water, and they have different colors on them. And they're, they're there on the starboard side because they tell ships if you stay on the starboard side of this buoy, you won't run into the narrow areas of a channel of a major ocean-going lane, a sea lane. And so there I am next to the bifurcation buoy, dinging in the middle of nowhere, no idea how I got there, don't know which way the land is. And by the way, did I mention this was 1983? Guess what that summer's movie was previewed? Come on out, July 22nd, 1983. Jaws 3D. Oh, yeah. And I had already seen Jaws 1. I wouldn't even go into our swimming pool after Jaws 1. I was convinced a shark, you know, great white like that, he could come through that little filtration hole. Uh Jaws 2, and now Jaws 3D. So I was looking forward to seeing that movie till I was next to that bifurcation buoy on the starboard side. And I looked out, and this is no kidding, I looked out 30, 35 yards from me, a fin popped up in the water. At first, it was just the top of the fin, and from my vantage point, it looked maybe like four inches. And you know what? When you're a lost boy and you're in the middle of a water and you don't know where you're at and the fin pops up, you get a prayer life. And I was praying. I said, God, I pray that's a dolphin. I pray that's a dolphin. For about 10 minutes, that fin would go out and it would come in and it would swim just round and round and round. And I tried to stay still. I just held on to that bell. And then about 30, 35 minutes in, the fin came way up out of the water. At that point, I thought, that's not a shark. That's a killer whale. Because that fin, to me, now I get it. I'm a preacher and I embellish. This is the eyes of a 14-year-old boy. If you saw the fin, it'd probably look like this to you. It looked like an airplane had turned over sideways. I mean, 
the fin looked like it was about a good three foot tall. And that thing started turning and it started making passes and it started coming closer and closer. And, and, it, and it was about 10 minutes and I looked and it had closed to about 15 yards out. And I'm thinking, I tried to climb up on that bell. And, you know, that's like climbing up on one of them old weeble wobbles. I mean, you just bang down on the water you went. You climb on this side, bang down on the water you go. And I'm making all kinds of noise. You know, sharks just love for you to, you know, panic in the water, kick your feet and everything. So I noticed that shark had, had stopped circling or whatever it was. And that fin just started coming toward me. And now I just instinctively, I held on to the buoy and I put my feet out in front of me because I thought two things. Number one, I'm, I'm going to be an easy meal, but I'm going to be spicy. He's going to have to get through a lot of kicking and screaming to get to me. I will kick him until he bites my legs off and I'll nub him. The, I'll bite him. You know, ang, ang, ang. I'll do whatever I can. And so I'm just, I'm poised for the fight. And then I heard... The, the, the motorized raft, kid you not, it's a suspenseful moment just like a movie. They pull up behind me and two guys reach down in the water and they grab me under both of my arms and pull me up backwards over the boat. And then the fin kind of goes down and out of sight. And I was paralyzed in fright. I'm sure I was a little bit in shock because the water was cold and because I'd been out there for almost an hour at that point and I was exhausted and they said, how in the world did you get out here? And it was the shore patrol. And I just said, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I was crying. I was saying, thank you, thank you. You saved my life. You saved me. You know, and they're like, well, we're going to take it. So it took about 10 minutes to get me back to shore. But, but I say this because during that time, my mind kept buzzing about that fin. I kept thinking about that fin. For the rest of my life, I've had dreams about that fin. For this reason, I don't even go out past my, my belly button when I go to the ocean. I don't go past my belly button because I figure I can run to shore before that thing can close the distance on me. So I say that because as an effective community of Jesus Christ, we don't just need to be those who welcome new members. We need to be like that shore patrol. We need to be out in the middle of the darkest of the waters where nobody would ever be caught dead. And we need to be patrolling and looking for the scragglers who are in the devil's line of sight, who are next to be his dinner that he would steal and he would kill and he would destroy. We need to go find them and yank them into the boat. Obedience to Jesus Christ is going to be messy in the 21st century, but it's necessary. Obedience is costly, it's messy, messy, and as I promised, it's advantageous. Look with me at Genesis 6 and down in verse 13. We're going to pick up that all-important verse 14, and then we're going to go down to verse 19. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark. Cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it, the length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark, finish it to a cubit above, set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy all flesh in which is breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, your sons' wives with you. And every living thing of flesh you shall bring two of every sort in the ark to keep alive with you. They shall be male and female. Obedience allowed grace to be received by Noah and his entire family. I, I worded that very carefully. I don't want you to think Noah earned that grace. He didn't. He was just doing his obedience to God and God chose to give him that grace. But because of his obedience, God took notice. And through his obedience, Noah became the bearer of this new alternative reality, the reality of the unmerited favor of God. And it's so beautiful because obedience brought life and salvation, not only to Noah, but to his whole family. 
I get agitated when we, the people of Jesus, slip into an ark mentality, though. We get into this mindset that says we just want to get inside. We just have to get inside and gather together and shut the doors and keep the bad influences out and keep the winds and the rains out and just stay in here until Jesus comes. And that's a lot of churches today have the ark mentality. Just get in the ark, seal the doors, pretend the outside world doesn't exist. And if they try to get in here, you just condemn them and yell at them and call them names. And and that mentality is the mentality that we see so much around us. But I want you to see Noah's ark. It's not just a story in the Old Testament. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, Peter says, Noah's ark was the prophecy of Jesus Christ who was to come. The ark was Jesus. Let me, let me tell you what that is about. If you go back to verse 14, verse 14 says that the ark was built with gopher wood. Let me tell you something about gopher wood. That's cypress. Did you know cypress wood does not rot? Because of its high concentration of sap, it doesn't rot. It's incorruptible. Okay, you're saying, Brother Ed, you're stretching a little bit. Let's move on. Pitch. The word pitch in the Hebrew, there is a word for pitch. Pitch is a tarry-like substance that makes things waterproof. Look back at verse 14. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark. Cover it inside and out with pitch so tarry like substance right that's how Noah understood it but the word that's used here is the same word in the Old Testament for atonement you know what atonement is that's the blood of the lamb I want you to see this ark that Peter says is a picture of Jesus it's incorruptible in its very flesh it is covered inside and out by the atonement the blood of the lamb and then three decks how long was Jesus in the grave one two three days and not only that where was the door it was in the side what was the last thing that happened to Jesus after he died Remember the earthquake and the the sky turned dark and the soldiers went with the clubs and they broke the knees of the two criminals and then the soldier grabbed the spear and he came to Jesus and he stabbed him in the side. And what happened? Blood and water flowed. You have this incorruptible vessel that is covered inside and out with the atonement the door is in the side and God says get inside and I will seal you inside what is it sealed from keeps the water out what are we sealed from in Christ it keeps the sin out see those that weren't on the ark perished but everybody inside the ark They lived. Don't you think it's time that you boarded the ark of the Lord Jesus Christ and came into the atonement for which he's provided? Don't you think it's time that the Holy Spirit seals you into faith in Jesus Christ? You've never trusted in him. It's time to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Everyone outside of Jesus Christ will perish. It will be death And it will be punishment for eternity. But everyone inside Jesus Christ will live eternally with God forever in peace. Noah received the covenant of God. You and I have a covenant of grace. And I hope if you don't have that, that tonight will be the time that you call on the Lord and are saved. I also pray that we won't take the ark mentality as a church. And everybody pile in here and close and lock the doors to the outside world. I pray we'll be the shore patrol looking for the lost in the darkness, shining the light. And so if you're here tonight, maybe you're feeling a little convicted that you've shunned the world. Hey, just remember Noah didn't condemn the world. 
He just lived such in contrast that the condemnation of the world was evident. Go shine your light. Tell the Lord tonight, Lord, I repent. I'm going to shine my light. And maybe you're here and you're struggling. And maybe you need a kind of salvation. You're already saved, but you need the Lord to save your sickness, save your finances, save your marriage. Did you know God is a redeemer of marriages? He's a redeemer of human lives and addiction. He's a breaker of chains. Whatever you need, we invite you to come tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're so thankful for the example that Noah gives us because God, he showed us what it is that we are to be and Father, how that we are to obey God and how that it will make us seem foolish and how that it will be messy and how that it will be advantageous that all who come into Christ are saved. I pray tonight if there's anyone here that does not know you as Savior and Lord, that, Father, they will take full advantage of what you did on their behalf when you took their sin and died in their place to pay the price of their punishment. And you shed your blood to wash them clean. And on the third day you rose again. And I pray tonight they will call on the name of the Lord. Say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I trust in you as Savior and Lord of my life. Lord, I thank you for them. And I thank you for everyone else who needs to hear this message of obedience. So tonight they'll go start their work week as if it's a mission field. And that there'll be light and darkness. Lord, if there's someone here tonight that needs a different kind of Redeemer. Not just someone to save their soul, but someone to save their marriage, their job, their health. Whatever it is, God, to break them free from the chains of addiction and problems. Let them come tonight. And Lord, let them find relief. We pray these things, Lord, thanking you for the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand together. And now's your opportunity. You can respond by stepping out right now and coming forward. And God will do whatever you need. You come as we sing. Just as I am. And praise the Lord. Again, we thank you for being a part of the services today. Once again, if you'd like to contact us or if you've made a decision, please go to the information at the bottom of the screen. You'll see our contact information along with our website. And we look forward to hearing from you. God bless you. And we hope to see you again real soon.